um, it, it's, a, it's a very interdisciplinary project. It has used um, evolutionary biology, anthropology, uh, um, economics, economic history, all of the above. Um, and John and I come to this project, I think, together um, because we have similar backgrounds. Both of us um, actually got undergraduate degrees, not in economics, but in anthropology. And then went on to get PhDs in, in economics. And um, both of us have been influenced by the work of uh, my stepfather, uh, Paul Shepard, who was a human ecologist that uh, wrote a lot about hunters and gatherers. And uh, made, certainly made me aware of the importance of understanding the significance of the transition to agriculture. So that's kind of the background of this project. Um, the problems we face right now are obvious, and I don't have to go into them in any detailed way with this group. Uh, we know the ecological uh, disaster uh, we face right now, and climate change, deforestation, soil erosion, dead uh, zones in the oceans, fisheries in the climate, etc., etc. And we understand well the, um, the, the social problems we have with inequality and poverty. And we're in this kind of extraordinarily contradictory situation because it's not easy to imagine how we're going to solve the problems of poverty and unemployment and inequality and, 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 and fix the biophysical uh, problems that we have. It's really almost a, 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 a contradiction that we can't uh, grapple with, especially not in this system, okay? Um, but we seem to be unable to disengage this system and to construct anything different, okay? And so that's a little problem for us. That kind of leads John and I, that perspective, sort of looking at the problems and thinking about why can't we disengage this? Why can't we get on another path? Got us to thinking about some of the more fundamental uh, questions. Um, like, why can't we disengage the system? And what is its fundamental nature and logic? Um, how, how did that system, globalized capitalism, for example, come to dominate? Uh, uh, the world? Um, how does it function as a system? And we would propose that these are some of the most profound questions of human evolution uh, at this particular historical moment. Okay. Humans think they're different. We think we're different than other animals. That because we have intelligence and the capacity uh, to, uh, to have culture, uh, innovation, technological innovation, that that somehow differenti differentiates us from other species. Um, but I think, John and I believe that um, we're not as unique as we might think. We start our analysis with Darwin. Um, Darwin had uh, a dangerous idea that the complexity that we see in the world uh, can be explained um, by the mechanical forces of natural selection, okay? And if you look at the kind of complexity we have and think about that, that's kind of a, that, that's very profound insight, that there's this tremendous complexity, and yet, uh, a, a theory of natural selection explains a lot about that uh, uh, complexity. Um, we think that some appreciation for uh, natural selection, and we're going to get into kind of an more expansive notion of natural, natural selection, has and, and, and evolution has the capacity to give us some real insight in terms of where we stand right now. Because we stand, as we all know, uh, with over 7 billion people on the planet in ecological collapse and engaged in a system that we can't seem to change. And that's the reality of our situation. Okay? Um, so we might ask, how did we come to dominate the planet? 
Okay? John and I have uh, uh, written somewhat extensively about this, but we believe that the domination of humans on the planet began with, with agriculture, began with settled agriculture. Agriculture, and there's a long story here that um, we don't have time to get into in a detailed way, but agriculture changed um, the dynamic of, of, of society and its metabolism in a fundamental, very fundamental way. Um, it became very expansionary and it's sort of trade. The trade of society was uh, this um, uh, uh, imperative to produce surplus. Um, the interesting thing about it is that we share that evolutionary dynamic with social insects who have a similar thing happen to them with the transition to agriculture. If you look at the population dynamics of humans over history, and we're all very aware of what happens um, with the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, and we've all seen the exponential growth curves of population. But you're measuring 7 billion people on your vertical axis, and if you go back before the Industrial Revolution, and you look at what happened to human population in the transition to agriculture, um, what you find is that some 6,000 years ago, there were maybe 6 million people on the planet. 2,000 years ago, so that's in the course of 4,000 years, the population had increased to about 250 million years. So this kind of population uh, dynamic that we're in began with agriculture and, of course, uh, has intensified uh, as exponential population growth will. Um, something like 800 million um, in the early 18th century to over 7 million now. Okay? Geologists call the Anthropocene, um, uh, say that the Anthropocene started about 300 years ago, um, but archaeologists, I think, many put the Anthropocene much earlier than that, 8,000 years ago. Um, if you look at what happened to human society after the onset of agriculture, you find something really interesting. Um, agriculture begins 10,000 years ago, okay? And so 15,000 years ago, uh, human societies in Europe and in the Americas would look something like this, okay? And then what happens after agriculture, within a relatively short period of time, you get societies that didn't have any contact with each other, but both made the transition to agriculture ending up in a very similar place. Uh, this is a quote by uh, Wright in a book called The Short History of Progress. And he said, what took place in the early 1500s was truly exceptional, something that had never happened before and never will again. Two cultural experiments running in isolation for 15,000 years or more at last came to the same place. Amazingly, after all that time, each could recognize the other's, the other's institutions. When Cortez landed in Mexico, he found roads, canals, cities, palaces, schools, law courts, markets, irrigation works, kings, priests, temples, peasants, artists, armies, astronomers, merchants, sports, theater, art, music, and books high civilization. And they developed independently. And they took on a very similar dynamic and, uh, and, and ended up looking uh, very similar, okay? The human transition to agriculture is not unique. Many social insects also practice agriculture and in, and in fact became social insects with the transition to agriculture. Ants and termites are examples, okay? And they show exactly the same dynamic as the human population does. Rapid population growth, uh, domination of ecosystems, and actually the sub subjugation, you would say, the subjugation of individuals um, for the good of the group. Social insects, uh, worldwide comprise about 2% of the insect population and account for 50% of the uh, insect, Earth's insect biomass. They are extraordinarily um, uh, successful as a species. 
And in the Brazilian rainforest, social insects represent again 2% of the known species there and com uh, comprise something like 75% of the uh, biomass. And they have extraordinary uh, civilization. So I have a little clip here to look at. Some of you may have seen it. Right? The next stage of the investigation was to find out what one of these subterranean cities looked like. The amount of cement required is extraordinary. For three days they kept pouring, until ten tons of cement had disappeared down the tubes. After a month, they begin the excavation, led by Professor Louise Forci. It takes weeks to uncover the secret megalopolis of the ants. the scientists remove tons of earth. At last, they begin to see the structure of the city-state. There are subterranean highways connecting the main chambers, and off the main routes are side roads. The paths branch and lead to many fungus gardens and rubbish pits. The tunnels are designed to ensure good ventilation and provide the shortest transport routes. Everything looks like it has been designed by an architect, a single mile. But of course that isn't true. This colossal and complex city was created by the collective will of the ant colony, the super organism. The structure covers 50 square meters and goes eight meters into the earth. In its construction, the colony moved 40 tons of soil Billions of ant loads of soil were brought to the surface. Each load weighed four times as much as the worker, and in human terms, was carried a kilometer to the surface. It is the equivalent of building the Great Wall of China. It is truly a wonder of the world. Domination of ecosystems 
and the emergence of a, a, a almost superorganismic structure um, dedicated to the group goal, and I put that in quotation marks, of producing economic surplus. Um, it was a rare event in human history, okay? And John's going to take it from, from there. Uh, okay. So anyway, we've been working on this uh, stuff about a year and a half, but one paper out, another paper under review. And again, this is sort of a work in progress, but we think we're really on to something with this, uh, this line of thinking. It's a whole new areas. Anyway, the first argument, agriculture, uh, the transition to agriculture was uh, a rare event that happened. Again, there are other, what's called, new social species. <coughs> But cultural sociality uh, really means production uh, or uh, production for surplus, not for life. So the second argument, uh, I think, is an economist, the contribution of Ben Grubby, that the reasons for this transition uh, really were uh, were economic. Uh, now we've been uh, also heavily influenced by David Sloan Wilson and his work on groups. <coughs> So uh, when with the transition to agriculture, groups began competing with, with each other. And also ants actually made the same transition. Hunter gathered ants that used to sort of collectively hunt these large insects. It also made a similar transition when they adopted agriculture. But once you, you, you go to the step of producing for surplus, and these other things start to kick in, these economic issues we call them laws, like the importance of the division of labor, the more expansion, the more division and actually, in a lot of the uh, insect literature, they actually quote Adam Smith in his discussion. Uh, increasing returns to size, larger groups can help compete other groups. Uh, tapping into stocks of productive resources uh, as opposed to living on flows. This is something I got from one of my teachers that was just erosion. So anyway, with the imperatives of surplus, uh, larger groups had, had an evolutionary advantage. Another consequence, uh, humans are a uniquely cooperative species, and there's a lot now coming out, especially in behavioral economics on the social brain. Uh, and there's some evidence that humans are actually hardwired to be cooperative. Human hunter-gatherer societies are characterized uh, by having uh, most of the members of the group are non-kin, they're unrelated, unlike other kinds of primates. But what we argue is that something happened with the transition of agriculture, and this tendency, this very positive human feature of cooperation became sort of co-opted and harnessed for the good of the superorganism. <coughs> um, so ant, uh, ants and termites, again, are characterized by producing a uh, surplus. Um, a, a, another person I worked with in this evolution group, Jennifer Keywell, who's an uh, uh, ant, a uh, ant person in Arizona State, is written about this. Uh, both ants and termites focus on uh, maximizing the surplus of fungus, so they don't, uh, you know, they don't eat plant material directly. But they harvest all kinds of plants as physical objects. They use those plants and then other insect matter and so on to feed the fungus, and that's what they uh, they live on. And by the way, the details of this are, are just astounding. There's even a uh, kind of like ant cast. Uh, it's like a you know untouchable cast of ants. There's a certain kinds of ants when they're born, they're sent down to actually clean the fungus and take care of the bacteria. And they're not allowed to come in contact with other ants when they when they go down. Um, but anyway, so we argue like in that film, the whole process really was a uh, process of group selection. So whole groups are selected, not individuals. Um, and so this we, we argue is kind of like selecting among jigsaw puzzles, puzzles with the the, the most, the best fit that the function is to sort of unify uh, whole those of the ones that are selected. Are selected. And uh, this, is, this is how complexity can arise through natural selection. Uh, okay, living off stocks. This is another, really the sort of hand in love with production uh, of surplus. Uh, again, leaf cutter ants, they use a variety of food sources, uh, plants, and, uh, and the four. Uh, the surface uh, uh, biomass it gives them an almost unlimited sort of source of raw material. And this source, this kind of kicks in this imperative for expansion. And again, the, the, the you know, with the demographic uh, transition, this also happens with humans as they're moving off 
flows from the ancients living off the stones and scaly soils. And then the second major transition was a current demographic transition where humans began to tap into the stocks of fossil fuels. And again, both of these sort of fundamentally changed human society and sociality. So again, with agriculture, uh, can we focus on a single goal? And we use the word goal, but it's not, again, it's not a conscious thing. We're, we're looking, we're sort of searching around for the words as we, uh, as we write this stuff up. Because it's not, a, it's not a conscious thing, it's something that sort of comes out of the system. If anyone has any ideas, then I don't know. Uh, with larger, more aggressive groups out competing other groups, uh, individuals became dependent on specific uh, others in the production of economic surplus. Again, Hunt, Hunt gathers that simple technology and the, the very virtue of being born in a hunter-gatherer society, you were able to, you knew what you needed to do to make a living. It's not that people didn't depend on each other in you know, very sort of tight -knit groups, but uh, no one person controlled another person in terms of access to the needs of production. Okay, the next step, again, this is what we're really beginning to get into, is a really agricultural state to industrial. This, this is where it, uh, it gets into the uniqueness of the human species. Again, markets, money, and so on. Uh, but we argue that capitalism really is a system that arose from these forces that were set in motion with agriculture. Uh, you know, markets eventually became the organizing principle of economic life. And so you had another group, <coughs> the production of surplus, the production of surplus value. So a different kind of dynamic uh, setting all together. And again, this process was uh, intensified with access to fossil fuels. I'm covering a lot of stuff. Just you know, ask questions later or talk to your interest in this stuff talk to us afterwards and you can get uh, Donald Campbell, again, he's a philosopher, but he's written a, a lot about uh, he's no longer alive, but he's written a lot about this process of all and uh, an important concept that we're starting to build on this notion of downward causation. So I'm just going to read this. Where natural selection operates uh, through life and death, death at a higher level of organization, the laws of the higher level selective system determine in part the distribution of lower level events and substances. All processes at the lower levels of the hierarchy are restrained by an act of conformity to the, uh, the laws of the so with the evolution of this, you have to call it a superorganism, then this set in motion all kinds of ways of behaving. And ant colonies uh, in these mechanical processes of each individual ants and something called uh, phenotypic plasticity and so on. With humans, you have social systems that sort of, the system sort of calls forth to reinforce this end quote goal of production. Okay, so why can't we change? This is really the question uh, we started with. Uh, so we are in the world socioeconomic system, and uh, related to uh, economic theories, including neoclassical economics, uh, came into being through this process of downward uh, causation. Systems, beliefs, religions were organized around this higher level goal of maximizing certain what's down. Again, this is not to say that there aren't countervailing forces. Uh, humans are not ants. Uh, there's a big debate now on human intentionality. Whenever we send some papers out for a few reports, humans are different and we have intentionality and so on. And basically we argue we have intentionality at the individual level, but not necessarily at the group level. One thing that's always bothered me about Jara Diamond's book, Collapse, is the subtitle. It's something like how societies choose to succeed or fail. I mean, Societies don't really choose anything, but they sort of lock into the systems. And trying to change it is almost as bad as an ant trying to change that ant superstructure that we just saw. Okay, but humans aren't ants. So the evolutionary dynamics between uh, individuals that are is they're not the same, um, but the results are really disturbingly similar. Again, the title of uh, the word anthropocene is in our paper, how do humans come to dominate? really follow the same path as these ultra-social uh, insects, especially the ants and terminals. The other sort of disturbing thing that comes out of this is the dark side of cooperation. Uh, individuals are expendable for the good of the group. 
Interestingly, as an objective, uh, objectivist libertarian philosophy, I've been uh, reading Ayn Rand lately. And if you look, if you, if you look, read that kind of philosophy in terms of the, this notion of ultra sociality, it's really the philosophy of Ayn Rand. I mean, Ayn Rand, Ayn Rand actually argues that if two people are looking for uh, a job and one realizes that the other is more qualified, that person is obligated to drop down. And again, the architect's speech, uh, you know, we're really addressing the, you know, the, the uh, most of the people in society. You don't, you don't contribute to uh, producing surplus, then you're out. We don't know you anything. It's not a human philosophy. Okay, what can we learn from uh, the open social uh, comparison? <clears throat> okay, this is sort of summarized thing. Uh, the evolutionary link to agriculture locked us into a structural change in terms of economic organization in the form of a division of labor around uh, the production of surplus. Group selection among agricultural groups favored those groups that most successfully uh, tied into these economic forces in the division of labor economies of scale uh, and exploiting both the natural world uh, and other humans uh, to produce surplus. And the entire metabolism of society changed uh, when it became organized around that goal. Okay, why hands? I mean, why is this just nothing more than just an interesting sort of uh, parallel? Uh, I think this because there, there are other examples of this same pattern that's happened in human history uh, among the social insects. Um, you know, and with ants, there's no need to talk about the mass struggle, division, surface plus, and power. So you can just want to focus on what drives accumulation, uh, production of surplus, and sort of uh, you know filter out the uh, the human superficialities of culture and intelligence. I'm trying to get a rise. <laughs> uh, a really interesting aspect of this is this notion of control without hierarchy, and uh, insect biologists are just beginning to look at this. There's a, uh, a woman at uh, the University. Deborah Ford. She's written actually an article showing the nature about control of that. And it, it really is, these, these uh, like ant colonies, human societies, they really do operate by an invisible hand, but it's very different than the invisible hand of, of standard economics. Because it doesn't arise from a kind of bottom up self interest, it arises from sort of these evolutionary mechanical uh, organizing uh, principles. It's not the top down control. It's not Again, the ant people are doing really interesting experiments to try to determine how, how this sort of collective intelligence comes forward. And there's a lot uh, that we have to learn from that. And again, people are just beginning to study these problems. Uh, so again, the whole thing, this is not an obsolete new idea with Elysian and I, but the, the whole system is sort of self-referential uh, and self-reinforcing. Uh, huge problem now with worldwide unemployment <coughs> because of mechanization, rationalization, so without economic growth, there's no need to, uh, no way to provide people who need jobs with employment. Uh, again, uh, unemployment is really coming, or manufacturing is coming really serious problem. Uh, so anyway, and we're, it's organized, of course, energy flows are central to the system. And uh, you can actually look at the metabolism of these uh, superorganism insect colonies, and they really function like an individual. Papers on that. So we lock into energy, energy flows. So unless we really get control of this thing, we'll keep using fossil fuels, keep pumping carbon into the atmosphere, because the whole system is uh, is organized around that system. Okay, can we change our evolutionary uh, trajectory? It, this whole thing makes it much harder than just I know many of us are critiques of the. Uh, pretty strong critiques of capitalism, the capitalist system, and so on. But we're arguing that capitalism is just a, the latest symptom of these uh, much larger uh, forces. So changing the course uh, really, really will require overriding this 8,000-year-old evolutionary force that brought us to this point. If we can't, then we're no different than a few social systems and have approach. So is there a positive message? So, <laughs> but, um, okay, the two catastrophes we're facing, again, sort of these 
destabilizing inequality um, and environmental catastrophe, really, it's not the result of human nature. I mean, we uh, saw all these problems and put that in books. We live sustainably on the planet in apparently egalitarian societies for 95 to 99% of human existence, depending on what you call human. Uh, sustainability, caring for others, uh, equality, uh, this defined what it meant to be human for hundreds of thousands of years. But this ability to cooperate was really co-opted by this uh, super organism that uh, evolved into uh, the global market. We keep asking ourselves, well, you know, are we really crazy with this stuff? Why isn't anybody seen this? Uh, I think it's, uh, a lot of it, I think, sort of the focus of the research has really been on individuals. I mean, sort of the revolution in economics is uh, happening now in behavioral economics. It really focuses on individuals. And the biologists uh, and uh, sociobiologists who study human behavior and other species, they really focus on primates, like chimpanzees and stuff. Their closest uh, can in terms of we're arguing we can actually learn as much or possibly more from social insects because of this notion of group selection and the evolution of uh, social norms. Okay, so what's uh, what's our future? Uh, what does the future hold if we can't gain control of the superorganisms? Okay, remember it's a mechanical evolutionary system that outcompeted other systems because it was more efficient in uh, producing surplus. The problem is evolution can't see ahead. I mean, evolution is full of organisms, uh, species that ended up as dead animals. It seems likely that uh, catastrophic climate change uh, is, uh, is really in our hearts. A few recent papers have come out just in the past couple of months that point out that we're really locked into four degrees Celsius warming by the end of this century. Probably. If you look at sort of the material structure that's already built in Here's a nice paper on this by So, uh, again, individual well-being, if you look at this after the social insects, will increasingly be increasingly unimportant as the system consolidates in the face of these destabilizing changes. Uh, so, I can imagine how humans obtain uh, the superorganisms <coughs> via um, persuasion and dominant personalities and self-deception and orative and things like that. Can we study ants on what are the signals that you said some of them are born and they go down to the lowest levels and clean the debris and such and that? Uh, nutrient dependent pheromone control is all like pheromones or how does that how does that all happen with the ants? Yeah, yeah, this the whole I mean most of the ants um, studies really focus on really specific things. For example, let's, let me just give one example. They've done this experiment where uh, they have the ants, this is in a lab, but the ants are walking across the little board, these are leaf cutter ants, and they have leaves of a certain size. So they're walking across. And they put a barrier up so the leaves don't fit in there. So almost immediately, the ants cut leaves half the size, and they're trying to stand the ants. And they're, the study of how that happens I really like to say they study the pheromones, the signals, and so on. But the larger question is, you know, how the hell did this come to be about? And they, that they really don't know. And that's what those people like Deborah Gordon are really starting to look at. We talked about this earlier, but there are a couple of people actually sort of working on some sort of system level, you know, how does it work kind of thing. Eric? Yeah. I, I really enjoyed this. And I'm going to extend it to the um, so I'm very interested in sort of the interface between um, kind of gliding over how agricultural society segues into industrial agricultural society, and you presented that as just well, this is just become more intense. But you could also make the case that it was a change in kind, and that the problem wasn't the transition to an agricultural society built a superorganism, but the superorganism got built when agriculture was combined with uh, the fish and the water stuff. So I just wanted to know what you're thinking about. That um, I think there is a, 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 a substantial difference in the development of state societies and then the transition to agriculture to capitalism out of that. 
I think you have to understand the, the, the kind of dynamic of food selection that we're talking about with agriculture. Um, it, it isn't in a human intentionality in the sense that I think what happened there is that you had people who were naturally observant who planted uh, seeds. And in order to get the benefit of those seeds, they have to uh, be able to be around when it grows and, and, and harvest it. That requires some kind of uh, um, uh, sort of notion of property. Okay? At the same time, you get the, the Pleistocene glaciers receding. And it, it, it's getting more difficult to hunt. And what you get developing, I think, is this kind of interlocking social structure where there are some of the members of society who are involved more in defense and maybe hunting where they can, and another part of the society that is engaged in the uh, production of agricultural output. And the imperative for them is to produce enough to now, now provide for an ever-expanding food that's not producing. So they get locked into, and they have an accommodation with energy because there's a lot of stock carbon built up in the soils. I think Wes Jackson calls this the uh, ghost-like quality of carbon. And they, uh, uh, so it's accommodated with, uh, with the energy, and of course the population dynamics changes as they become more sedentary. And so you get this kind of lock-in with this group. Out of that surplus production, I think markets come. You get markets trading, expanding, and markets coming out of that. And then markets themselves take on a life of their own. And I think this is a process of downward causation and, 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 and kind of human institutional impact on a system that already exists that accommodates it. So you get this fundamental change. It's not just the production of surplus anymore, it's the production of surplus value. As markets take hold and expand, this system takes on kind of a new force and a new dynamic. So in some sense, it's more human, uh, the product of human culture, in a way, capitalism. But in another way, it comes to function more mechanistically and almost more like a superorganism, uh, like these ants. And I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah. Um, it's, it's part of a great conversation. <laughs> and ultimately, it's like, hmm, will we solve the problem by going back to hunting and gathering no. and getting rid of that culture no. and getting rid of oil? No. No, I don't, I, I don't know that we would. I think we have to cut off the energy dynamic if we want to uh, change things. That's obviously a complicated problem, but I think that it presents us with, at a philosophical level, level, some of the most profound questions that we confront right now. Like, what is our evolution about, our social and economic evolution about, and how much human agency is there to change it? I mean, I think that's the question that we're confronted with. Is there any evidence with of this. Ants off their energy Huh? Is there any evidence of ants cutting off their energy dynamics? I think they do, from time to time, have colonies collapse. Um, I don't know that much, but I think they do. There's actually a novel by E.O. Wilson called Angel.
people talk about economies as though we, you know, we've reached, you know, somebody wrote this book, The End of Nature, The Last Man, as though we've reached, not that nature was, I don't remember what it is, but the last man. Huh? End of history, The Last Man, basically arguing that we've reached the, you know, free market democracy, capitalist economies, that, that, that that's, there's no more change. And that, you know, ecological economists talk about radical change in our economic systems. My argument is economies constantly undergo radical change. We're just trying to push it in an appropriate direction. And to go way back, and as John already pointed out, some of these ideas came from a book, from a book he wrote, you know, hunter-gatherers, highly nomadic people, walk 25 miles a day. You could not carry with you very much. If you tried to accumulate any kind of surplus, you would starve to death, because you couldn't keep track of the animals and plants as they moved on. So, you know, this idea that humans are inherently insatiable is re uh, refuted by 99% of human history. We go on to agricultural economies, which is really, so, you know, the place seen at the whole scene, you know, and here's some of the things that uh, Lizzie talked about. We're getting, you can own, you grow crops that you can own, so you have property rights, you have more division of labor, you have political hierarchies. Another interesting thing is we've got higher population densities. We're able to record knowledge, and with higher population densities, this idea is circulating much faster. Knowledge improves faster. You get uh, recording knowledge, you can transmit it to the next generation, you get trades, you get this rapid increase in the exchange of ideas and the growth of knowledge, which is a very important thing. Um, then we go to the industrial economies, which is the dawn of the Anthropocene. I'm going with a geologist rather than an archaeologist. Or, um, and, uh, you know, so it's a fossil fuel economy based on non renewable resources. And there's a thing about fossil fuels that if I burn a barrel of oil, there's no way you can burn it. I can own that barrel of oil, keep you from using it. It fits beautifully into a market economy. We've got to compete for that barrel of oil. One person gets it, somebody else doesn't. So it's a really this idea that, um, you know, the uh, economic transitions drive your economy. Well, fossil fuels are really uniquely adapted for a growth market economy. Um, so we had this, you know, this rapid acceleration of growth. We now will actually say that there's been a profound revolutionary change in our economic system since I was a kid. And when I was a kid, you know, you held stocks. Stocks were held for seven years. Most, uh, most buying and selling of foreign currencies were to buy goods and services. Now there's like, you know, uh, a recent estimate by the UBS, I think it is, in Switzerland, said there were $5 trillion a day in buying and selling of foreign currencies. They revised it to only like 2 or $3 trillion a day, something like that. Um, but this is like, you know, 20 times the size of the global economy. It's all based on speculation. It's not producing anything. It's just per buying and selling things to gain revenue. And I would actually argue that we are reaching an era where humans have used up a lot of the excess capacity in nature where it's very difficult to increase supply. So economists always tell us, well, the price, if a resource becomes scarce, the price goes up, we either develop a substitute or we use less. So there's this, uh, it's a, we have a negative feedback loop. Price leads to lower demand. But when we get into a, a world where a very full world, we're using up most of the resources, the price of food goes up. It's very difficult to produce more food now because we're running into constraints. The price of oil goes up. Very difficult to produce more oil because it's simply not there to produce. And under those situations, an increase in price leads speculators, so we have a you know, huge inequality in wealth, you have a lot of pools of money for speculation, they will buy these resources with what they call inelastic supply. Um, you can't increase the supply in, in response to a price increase. And these resources that are essential and have no substitutes, like food and energy, a small decrease in quantity is a huge increase in price. You buy some, keep it off the market, price skyrockets. We've gone from an economy driven by price as a negative feedback loop that decreases demand to price driving positive feedback loops increasing demand in a speculative economy, which is a profoundly different economy, and at least a massive redistribution of what is becoming an increasingly finite pool of wealth. And I would argue that that is as big a change as kind of slipped in under the, you know, under our radar is anything we're talking about in ecological economy. So now we really need to move into, um, you know, to recognize these limits. So we have the societal challenges of an prophecy. And you've all seen probably this figure of the planetary boundaries. So here's ecological limits that we can't surpass without threatening catastrophic impacts on life. And, you know, the biodiversity loss is well beyond. You know, nitrogen emissions are uh, exceeded the boundaries. It's a little deceptive. Nitrogen emissions to talk about the flow of nitrogen into the oceans, eutrophication, all this. For carbon, they're talking about the stock of carbon in the atmosphere. If you're looking at the flow of carbon into the atmosphere, we've blown past that boundary as well. So we have these planetary <laughs> boundaries that we're exceeding that threaten, you know, really catastrophic impacts, and they're the um, 
outer limit. Then this woman, Kay Rigworth from Oxford, pointed out, well, there's also these social limits, these physiological needs. We need to meet people's basic needs. So she created this sustainability film. You can't see it very well, but the outer rim is these planetary boundaries. We have to stay within those planetary boundaries. The inner one, the basic physiological social necessities we need to make, like ensuring food and energy for people. And we haven't even achieved the minimum there. So we're blown past the boundaries on the ecological side. We haven't even met the minimum requirements on the um, social needs. So I put this in a different way. If you look at it as economist as I am, you know, this is the size of your economy, the production of throughput. This is the marginal value, the benefits we get from an additional unit using, you know, neoclassical thinking. And if we account for those ecological boundaries from our economic production, from agriculture, from anything else, the cost of climate change, nutrition, biodiversity loss become immeasurably high as we approach these planetary boundaries and are threatened by catastrophe. On the other hand, the benefits of that throughput on this side, as the simplest one to think about is food, very obvious. We've got to feed people. As you have a lot of food, you know, 3,500 calories per person, you know, very, very low marginal utility to more, probably uh, this utility. But as you approach that physiological threshold where you're not meeting your basic food consumption requirements, the, the benefits become immeasurably high. And what the evidence suggests right now at this stage in the Anthropocene, if we tried to feed 7 billion people without exceeding those planetary boundaries for carbon, for food, for uh, nitrogen, et cetera, it would be incredibly challenging to do. So what we might have in economic terms is a supply <laughs> curve, as economists call this marginal, marginal cost of supply, and a demand curve, which is marginal benefits. Supply and demand don't intersect. You know, we have no sustainable outcome here. Um, that we're way, you know, we're we're, degre we're exceeding planetary boundaries and not meeting basic uh, physiological needs for people. So this is a way to think about things and marginal benefits measured in what the ecosystem needs and what people need. But economists, of course, look at your marginal market costs. They ignore all the ecological costs. They don't run, you know, we don't encounter prices. And then on the um, for poor people, you know, you can only demand food if you have money. So economists tell the story that as the price of, you know, something goes up, we stop allocating towards less and less important uses. What we actually do is stop allocating to less and less important people. And this would be like Africa and India dropping off the map there, of the, of the demand curve, for example. So here's the problems we face in the Anthropocene. We have to solve these problems. How do we do that? So we have this idea of market solutions. Let's have the neoliberal market solutions to all these things. And you know, we have competition, self-interest, and free choice are the things that are going to drive our solutions. And it's all about preference satisfaction. You know, economists saying, I don't really know what you like and what uh, she likes, and we'll let people decide their free choice in the market. And it's all about preferences. We let people satisfy their own preferences. And so this is part of it. We let people satisfy their preferences. We're going to also internalize externalities. We're going to take those ecological costs. We're going to feed them back into the, presumably first we're going to have technocrats measure them, feed them back to the politicians who will then feed them back into the economy prices, and then our prices will reflect full costs, and that's going to create incentives for innovation and substitution, and that's going to solve the problem. So the big thing economists forget when they say that markets are all about preferences, is you know, we've got to let people fulfill their own preferences, they forget to say those preferences are weighted by purchasing power. So, uh, and this is fine. If you like oranges, you like apples, I'm comfortable weighing those preferences by purchasing power. But a question of access to food, maybe that's a separate thing than preferences and taste. Maybe that's a more basic need. So if we look at this, so okay, let's feed the full cost of agriculture and the price of food. And then we're going to allocate that food, preferences weighted by purchasing power. So Americans, we spend about 6% of our income on food for take-home consumption. And that's food at the market. You go to the market, you buy a loaf of bread. You buy a $2 loaf of bread. 20 cents of that was for the wheat. So maybe 1% of our budget actually is for raw food. Africa, on the other hand, they're spending 75% of their income on food. Maybe 50% of that is on raw food. So the big question is, we allocate preference weight by purchasing power when the price of wheat doubles, or actually triples, as it did in 2007. You know, how many of you dramatically reduced your consumption of bread in response to a tripling of the price of wheat? And the answer is none of you. 
because we have so much money, it's such an insignificant impact, that rising price has no impact on our behavior, you know, no impact on how much we drive and how much we eat, and has absolutely profound impacts on poor people. So if we go with this market thing, we're going to ration access to these critical resources based on our purchasing power, and no wonder old white guys who are most economists really like that idea because they're the ones who get it. So I would actually argue that as we address these problems in Anthropocene, we've got to recognize that preferences are fundamentally different. If your preference for an apple and orange is fundamentally different over who gets access to food. And we've got to stop saying that our economy satisfies people's preferences. We've got to focus on satisfying people's physiological needs, which maybe requires some non-market mechanism for allocating those essential non-substitutable resources we can't do without. And I, unfortunately, don't have time to develop any ideas much here, but I don't want to do that. So I also want to talk about this idea that let's internalize externalities. So when I pay for something, it will reflect the full cost. This is just a map that shows who causes climate change, countries in red. Um, you know, left cause of climate change. And here, who suffers from climate change? Countries in red. Those who cause the problem suffer least. Those who don't least to cause the problem suffer most. If we put the full price of my carbon dioxide uh, uh, emissions into when I pay for things, well, I will buy all the food and everything, and Africans will starve, and I'll still be able to afford enough CO2 that they're still going to starve because they can't grow food. So you know, this idea of externalities and externalities in the Anthropocene, where we have a fundamental geological force. You know, this isn't something that's just you know, me affecting one other person. This is a planetary impact that can't be decided by individuals. It's got to be decided as a group. Um, so you know, uh, a lot of the problems we face also like global climate change. It's what they call a prisoner's dilemma. It's, um, you know, it's in my rational, no matter what everybody else does, it's in my rational self-interest to spew as much CO2 as I want because I get all the benefits from it, share all the costs with everybody else. And so it's a well-known problem that um, you can only, you know, that uh, uh, there's no competitive uh, self-interest solution to this. You've got to cooperate to solve it. Same with natural resource depletion and biodiversity loss. If I go out there and harvest all the bluefin tuna, and I can sell them, I think they recently went on for a million, two million bucks in Japan, I don't know what it was. Um, uh, you know, I get all the gains from selling that, okay, you know, we're going to wipe the species out until 97% completed now, but um, I get the gains from selling that loop in, I share the cost with everybody else, so we have this, uh, you know, again, um, and the biodiversity loss, loss of ecosystem services, there is no individual self-interested solution to that problem. Innovation in the information age is the same kind of thing. Let's say I develop, put a huge amount of money as Exxon, let's say, and put, develop a clean, all, uh, you know, clean, decentralized, non-polluting alternative to fossil fuels. Well, China, we know, can hack into their computers, download that information, produce it themselves. So Exxon would invest trillions or billions of dollars to do that, and then somebody else could get equal benefits without um, investing. So there's this huge thing in the information age. The you know, an individual producing knowledge. Um, is not, you know, it's, it's a, you're not going to put the resources into that. And as a result, fossil fuel sector in the United States invests 0.03% of sales in R&D. They simply don't put anything into that because it's not a way, it doesn't make sense in the market economy. So for all of these things, it's very well established that cooperation is the best solution. And it's very, so this is a work by uh, Nowak and E.O. Wilson. Um, by Nowak's at a book of super cooperators, he proposes there's six has the cooperation that have evolved. Humans are the only ones capable of all six. We're the super cooperators, the most ultra social of ultra social species. We're the ones who can cooperate. And that you can only solve these problems through cooperation. What's interesting is that evolutionary evolutionists, uh, behavioral economists, anthropologists, mathematical biologists are all converging on the same idea that we need cooperation to solve these problems. Um, so uh, um, so the question is, you know, can people cooperate? Stupid question. Of course we can cooperate. Um, and one thing I want you to think about, and this comes from another uh, a book I really love, and I know um, John Gallagher just published an article with the author of this book. But in the book, he tells, and I use this in all my students now, all my classes, think of five characteristics of a good person and five characteristics of an evil person. And we've done this, I've done this in different countries, different cultures, we've it down. A good person is somebody who puts the group ahead of the individual. An evil person is somebody who puts the individual ahead of the group, as economists say we do. So the question is, are we good or evil? 
And I would argue that what kind of species is going to put the notion of good or evil to define them as evil? No, I mean, you know, most likely, so the good, good person who puts the group ahead of the individual. Um, and I would actually say that there's a lot of studies, these are just a bunch of citations. So people who study economics become systematically more selfish, more corrupt, more conservative, and so if there's two, two things at play here. One, there's a self-select, and this is, this is very, all of these references repeat, you know, some of our meta studies of all these things, um, two, two things at play. One is that more selfish individuals are predisposed to go into economics, but you become even more selfish through the economic program. Uh, another study is, they have these studies that if you trigger somebody to think about money, they become systematically more selfish. So we have designed an economic system, you know, where the theory is developed by selfish people, but a system that makes us more selfish, self-interested, less cooperative. How much time do I have? Okay. Um, <laughs> so, so, um, so let's say with, with genetics, this idea that evolution of cooperation, where does it come from? So within genetics, there's this idea that John talked about multi-level selection, and the idea goes back to Darwin. It's getting a lot of currency now, and I don't want to go into details, but um, you get a bunch of hunter-gatherers. The, the population with the most cooperative people helping each other out is going to outcompete the other groups. So, but within the group, the individual who's least cooperative gets all these benefits from others, um, outcompetes others within the group. So we have two evolutionary pressures guiding us. One for altruism and cooperation between groups, or in competition between groups, one for selfishness within groups. So what we have is kind of a bell curve of pro-social behavior, very cooperative individuals, very uncooperative individuals, and we have this big plasticity, that we can change things. Um, and I won't go through, um, uh, well, very quickly, I'll, um, uh, so there's, there's, we've evolved these things. One thing, just quickly, oxytocin. Economists say we're all about pleasure, and that we want to maximize our utility. <coughs> oxytocin is, uh, when you cooperate with people, you get this hormone that gives you a good feeling, um, and it makes you cooperate. It's the same hormone you get when you have sex. And if I'm looking at measuring my utility, I'm going to go with that one. I'm not going to go with like this. Right? So, so cooperation really generates this uh, this pleasure and gives us pleasure. Um, um, and we also have these cultural mechanisms that promote cooperation. And one thing is, if you punish non-cooperators, if somebody doesn't pay their taxes or hides their money offshore, and you really look down upon them and scorn them in society instead of lauding them as the highest that we should achieve, um, you know that has a big impact. Uh, that if you punish people who don't cooperate, it leads to more cooperation. And if you punish people who don't punish people who don't cooperate, then you get a really robust mechanism for ensuring cooperation across culture. That's just very well studied mathematically, uh, empirically, and um, you know. Uh, um, so those are a couple, and I just don't want to take any extra kind of time. So, um, so basically, the economics of cooperation. I would argue that peak oil, food, and pandemics. How do we solve these problems? How do we feed everybody with limited resources? How do we have energy to uh, fuel our society? As I said before, that um, you know, for energy, we compete for oil. But now, what the new types of energy we're going to have are going to be alternative energy. Let's simply begin solar power. No matter how much solar power we use in the US, it leaves no less solar power for India or China or other countries. So we're not competing for that source. If China develops a great solar energy technology, or we develop one, let's say, and we give it for free to China, they're going to make it better. The technology, the ideas improve, they're not going out, they get better, we get it back better than it was. So suddenly we have a fundamental shift in the nature of the economic problem driven by energy that fossil fuels we inherently compete for alternative energies improve through cooperation. And I won't go through this in great detail, but there's a lot of interesting things to say about it. Um, and, but the value of these alternative energies is maximized at the price of zero. If the price is too high, I have all this great technology, I sell it. India and China will continue to burn coal, we get climate change, I'm screwed as well as them. The value is maximized at the price of zero. Um, and uh, there's this thing that Hunter, uh, that Culler said, energy transitions produce cultural transitions. And I'll just end up with this quick anecdote, or it's more like an analogy. So there's a bunch of this cooperative behavior goes across the species. You know, prokaryotes, eukaryotes, fish, humans, you know, insects, humans. And uh, one example, this Pixococcus xanthus is a little prokaryote, simplest thing, um, exactly the same as the slime mold, the Pictoscelium. Um, under conditions of abundance, they don't cooperate. They just out there getting their food, no worries. But when resources become scarce, 
they bond together in this slug, send up little pseudopods to find out where resources are, and they can all go after it. And in fact, they put a little slug of these uh, 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 slime moles the, uh, this, um, on a topographical map of Spain with food in the cities of proportionate population, recreated the road networks of Spain. Um, and uh, so, but these guys, so in conditions of scarcity, they cooperate. In conditions of extreme scarcity, they become ultra cooperative. Many of them, like 80% of the Muscat uh, will form a stalk and they die to create, a, allow a spore mass at the top for the others to spread. They total self sacrifice, total altruism. And, um, and they've shown that it even works when they're not the same, they're not, not related individuals. So, my hypothesis is that perhaps in our era of energy abundance and fossil fuels, we could deal with much less cooperation. We could be more competitive. We didn't need to, we didn't know we relied on each other so much. And it drove this more selfish behavior in a market economy, driven by self-interest and, uh, and competition. And now, as we move into greater resource scarcity, I'm hopeful, that, um, that, you know, that suddenly, and all the evidence we moved in that direction, that cooperation is required to solve the problems, that we're pre-wired for cooperation. We just need to create those economic institutions that lead us to cooperate. We know how to do that. If I had more time, I would go on length about that. But as it is, I don't want to pick up in the tent. So I'm just basically saying that um, we can develop institutions that promote cooperation over competition. We know a lot about how those work. The problems we face require cooperation to solve. And we have this convergence across the disciplines showing that you know, we've evolved to be cooperative, we can allow institutions to be cooperative, and uh, I will turn it over to Ken. So. You might have time for one question. We can ask the rest of you to get a little rush of oxytocin for your forbearance for not asking the questions. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you guys, uh, yeah, I guess I would ask the question, what do you think renewable energy can actually be free or have zero cost and not be dependent on some kind of fossil mineral or something? Wait, what, what would it do? What renewable energy? No, there's definitely not. So the renewable energy, so the renewable energy is, is, is come, as uh, Copper also said, energy has an impact on the environment. If we had a totally clean, decentralized, you know, source of energy that was uh, did no environmental damage, we'd use it to destroy the ecosystems. And the other point is that you know our clean technologies, you know, for example, they mostly use rare earths, which are highly toxic to produce. So what we need is to develop the technologies that become increasingly greater and more friendly. And we want everybody to use those technologies. There's no such thing as free riding on a green technology, because the more people that use it, the better off we all are. So it's uh, so there are no... Well, I guess I was wondering about your theory, given that somebody might still have those rare earth minerals, just like they might have the oil. Right. No, and, that, and so the thing is, so we need the knowledge. We need to develop those uh, you know, innovations that make it cleaner and cleaner and cleaner. Um, so it's, it, it's uh, as I say, it's really hard to get anything decent across in 15 or 20 minutes, <laughs> no matter how fast you talk. So as Josh was telling me about bad things that happened to you studying economy, economics, George turned around and hit me. <laughs> and but there is an antidote, and that's called studying heterodox political economy instead of economics. So that's what I want to do. Um, so basically, I think pretty much every <coughs> logical economist has seen this. Josh, you've seen this, right? <laughs> there's an independent economy, there's an ancient world, there's a full world, and you know, a an economy can't grow forever in a finite and non-growing ecosystem, a physical system. It's just, you know, it's incompatible. But as we try to solve that problem, it turns out to be pretty difficult because once we address that, then a whole other series of dilemmas that are embedded in this one, um, because like, we just have a box that says economy. And not only are there in external biophysical limits, but there's a whole lot of internal limits that are embedded into the economy that we, I want to try to address some. Um, so here's the dilemma. What happens when you stop growing? And ever since well, there's a lot of people who say, well, 
Neoclassical economics is, is dependent on growth. Actually, neoclassical economics is almost entirely static and comparative static. Um, actually, they kind of took physics, the Hamiltonian, which yields the Lagrangian, started there, but they left out the conservation principle. I mean, if you really think of economic growth and the conservation of value, are pretty incompatible. So it leaves the system pretty static. So we didn't get a growth theory until the 1950s. And now, at that point, economic growth became the vehicle to provide almost all the other good things. Employment. In fact, Congress passed a law in 1946. They called it the Employment Act. Reasonably full employment with what is reasonable left completely vague, stable prices, and economic growth was the vehicle that provided everything. So here's our first dilemma that everybody I talk to always says, Oh, I'm an environmentalist. But if, and overall, yes, environmentalist, but if you stack it up one to one with almost anything else, the long term viability of the climate of our biogeochemical cycles always comes in second. It's jobs, jobs, jobs. It's, I, you know, I don't know. It's, the climate's a long way away. Actually, it's not. But you know, that's the dilemma. A system that doesn't grow within our present institutional structure that I don't call free enterprise system or the market system. I call it globalized monopoly of finance capital. Um, those two things are in the link. They're, they're, they're incompatible. They're, without growth, you can't produce employment within the present system. Um, and then just to try to define the Anthropocene, it's defined by exponential growth and carbon emissions. It's, by the way, the, it, at the Mauna Loa, Observatory where Keeling and Ravel work, they just they just got um, 400 parts per million, which means we're locked into more cl climate change than Copenhagen allowed for. Um, the other thing is that we have this economic growth that is largely driven by cheap energy, and that's produced. Cumulative exponent economic growth that looks nearly exponential, but you know it's <coughs> got cumulative energy use, it's got cumulative carbon emissions, and it's the cumulative growth that's causing those problems. It's the buildup in stocks and the continued use of flows. Um, but if you look at the kind of growth that creates employment which is percentage growth, um, it looks really different. It's all over the place with a downward trend line. Um, so Etsy Delmar, the great mathematical economist, wrote in her famous paper, Expansion and Employment, that he started it out with a quote from the mathematician Lewis Carroll, from the Alice in Wonderland series where he talks about the Red Queen. Like, here we're a slow country. You have to go faster and faster to stay even. If you want to go ahead, you have to go even faster than that, which leaves us a dilemma that we're having to constantly build up capital stock just to provide the growth to stay even. But we can't entirely because when you invest and you have Technological change, not only do you basically spend, have a spending outlet to absorb aggregate demand, and that's short term, but you create additional productive capacity, and that's long term. So the short term solution creates the long run dilemma that prices alone simply aren't going to touch. Delmar himself suggested that. The government shouldn't be a pump primer, but a long-term investment banker. Um, OK, dilemma number two, the political process. Um, we've got the need to act right now to manage carbon emissions, 
hydrocarbon use, ocean acidification, uh, biodiversity loss, uh, almost you know, the pressure in biogeochemical versus the glacial pace of political activity. I put glacial in quotes because glaciers are starting to melt exponentially anyway. But now it's in behind political riddle. Life profound, profoundly different pre-analytical visions of how the economy works. That you know, if you look at the drivers of economic growth, supply side, their technological change, and productivity, and increases in the supply of labor, their cheap energy, and then on the demand side, there's all those components of aggregate demand, which is consumption, investment, and government spending, and net exports. And um, institutionally, through, throughout the post-war period, we had a whole series of accords. There was a, a what was often called the Treaty of Detroit. It was the 1948 contract between the United Auto Workers and General Motors, where they did something that Marx could have never anticipated, that capital shared surplus value with some of the workers, mostly white men in unionized industries. Um, and then there was a capital citizen court. It's a, we have this kind of overall social goal, economic growth, and it's based on anti-communism. And when those went away, so too did the capital labor court. Uh, when the economy stopped growing, and when we did not bring in enough surplus value from the rest of the world, we could not afford to share it anymore. Cooperation reached a new level. Um, you know, military spending is a component of aggregate demand, but it also makes the world safe for corporate profits. Uh, David Corton had said we just need to redefine the role of the military. You know that we should protect our shores and our people and not protect the potential profits of multinational corporations. And, you know, there's lots of uh, examples of that. Or, uh, that the list could probably go on for a long time. Um, so, you know, there's a neoliberal perspective, a right-wing perspective. And I I haven't gone all the way to read Anne Rand, <laughs> but I have been reading uh, Barry Bluestone and Ben Harrison's, who, who are, who've just written a book, well, their latest book, their last book together, because Ben unfortunately died, um, which was called, uh, Growing prosperity. If you think of it, all those elements that is in most ecological economists' vision, that the economy needs to be less unequal, more cooperative. If you look at the data, periods of slow economic growth are periods where you see greater movements in inequality. Um, so we see that the neoliberal vision is built on three things. The neoclassical growth stillages. And remember, neoclassical economic status, so they needed a growth so The Wall Street virtuous circle and the Wall Street Pennsylvania Avenue, of course. Um, the neoclassical growth is this faster growth rates will only incur when there's more investment. That increased investment will happen if interest rates are kept low. Uh, low interest rates will only happen if there's stable prices, and therefore economic growth will only happen if inflation is kept under control and there's lots of savings. Micro theory. At least the micro theory approach to what is now macro the Wall Street virtuous circle is that you have subdued inflation, increased savings, and those you know, result in rising stock prices, and rising stock prices increase wealth, and increase wealth increases spending. So there's the big wealth effect. So you 
Notice there's no <coughs> wages driving spending. It's just stock market increases. And then there's output growth, and then there's increased investment, and there's increased productivity, and the whole thing cycles over again. And notice there's no excess capacity, and there's no unemployment. You know, just basically, people have a lot of money, spend a lot on luxuries, and that drives output growth, and the whole thing <coughs> grows into marvelous prosperity, and there's no such thing as experimental economy, pollution. Got to have a quote from Larry Summers if you're talking about neoliberalism. You, know, uh, you know, financial markets don't just oil the wheels, they, they are the wheels. So we finish. When I talk about you know, not free markets, but globalized monopoly finance capitalism, it's we're being increasingly dominated by financial markets. Um, then there's the contradictory role of the Federal Reserve. I mean, they are the lender of last resort. When the boat is sinking, their job is to fail. Ben Bernanke, the new head, is sometimes called helicopter bin, you know, just go to a helicopter, drop money out there. He was a student of Milton Friedman and Anna Schwartz, who thought the depression was caused by, you know, too tight a liquidity. Um, versus the neoliberal idea that the economy's there, the Fed is there to fight inflation, keep prices stable. Well, you know, what if the Fed's flooding the financial markets with $85 billion a month? Why is inflation so low? Oh my conservative students. Well, there's an equally <coughs> uh, powerful debt deflation loop that asset prices start falling, and then there's losses, and then there's credit contraction, and then they sell things off to meet the margin requirements, and balance sheets shrink, and it basically turns in, like, like Josh was saying, the virtuous circle on the negative feedback loop turns into a positive feedback loop which spirals things downward. Um, and then there's the Wall Street, Pennsylvania. It is my contention that the last liberal president in the United States, economically speaking, was Richard Nixon. Um, Bill Clinton's basically completely bought into the Wall Street, I mean, you had Ruben and Summers and the whole rogues gallery there to drive his economic. And Obama's kind of a partial exception. He publicly says he's a Keynesian, but he bails out the financial markets. Um, and then there's this kind of now somewhat defunct liberal growth strategy based mostly on propping up aggregate demand plus having some wage growth so there's some role for unions except for Chicago teachers but I'll talk about that um, but one of the things that Del Mar said we talked about the dual nature of investment that in a competitive economy excess capacity takes care of itself but in a monopolized economy it tends to drag the economy down into slow growth so you know, we've got to really talk about the monopolized economy. We can't talk about free markets, and we cannot pretend that the way an individual market works is the way the market works as a system. There's too many positive feedback loops in there. So dilemma number four is we have to figure out the difference between a market and the market with a capital M like Carl Bologna used. Um, that is, uh, the economy is dominated by oligopolies, that they don't compete on prices, that they maximize profits, not by setting marginal revenue equal to marginal cost, but by, by reducing their costs and expanding their market share. And I was just up in Calgary, um, Jeff Carter, and, ben, and one of the heads of trade socials, oh, we really want a price on carbon. And my point was that, you know, in the United States, if anything happens to either re stop them from re reducing costs or reducing their ability to expand market share, the, the prefix job killing immediately gets attached. 
to it. Um, so since they don't compete in a way price, the surplus tends to rise. They have to spread their way out of it. And if you can't find some productive way, then waste it. So, well, you know, everybody says capitalism is about efficiency. But macroeconomically, in the era of monopoly, globalized finance capitalism, it's largely about keeping the economy propped up by waste. Now, one of the problems is, is that you need to reduce your costs, especially your labor costs, and increase your market share. You, that, how do you sell more and more stuff to people who have less and less money? Well, that's what the debt explosion was out. Um, the other thing is, you know, you have to measure it, how, how monopolized it is. And, you know, there's just how you do it, concentration ratios. And depending where you look, we have a really competitive economy or a really monopolized one, a expensive one. But, you know, if you look at food, uh, you know, the top four firms only control 16%. But, you know, soft drinks, it's like 59. My favorite one is chemicals. It's pretty competitive. But things like petrochemicals and fertilizers are very highly monopolized. And, um, transport is pretty competitive. Oil pipelines are pretty constant. My favorite is finance and insurance is really competitive. But secondary market financing of derivative securities and that, that's highly concentrated. So I think there is enough evidence to say we, were, we are in a very monopolized economy and those internal dynamics take over. Um, interesting, if you take even the most competitive stuff, retail trade, the concentrations are going up over time. You could put it in graphical form. You know, there's the percentage of concentrated industries and profits of the biggest concentrated corporations and the net value of acquisitions. Uh, and here's the problem. We've got capitalism as a system that has to grow. Capitalism is defined as capital accumulation. Without capital accumulation, we don't have capital. But, you know, it's, you can show mathematically, so you see John Harris's paper, that it's mathematically possible to have a low-growing economy, but I don't think it's possible without the fundamental rearrangements of social relations that Lisey's been talking about. Um, the dilemma is capitalism must grow, but uh, monopoly capitalism doesn't produce growth. It's what Herman Daly called the failed growth economy. Um, so here's the new normal. The old normal, we had oil crisis, and then we had another normal, and then we had a debt crisis and oil crisis combined, and now we've got a new normal that we are in the that must grow to provide employment and can't grow. Um, do I have a minute? Yeah, just about <laughs> really So I'm going to not explain. Oh, yeah. Here, here's, there's, there's these truisms in economics if you study it. You know, the system is equitable. You get out what you put in. Wage equals the marginal product of labor. And then income is just income by, divided by hours of labor, productivity times the size of the labor force. So what's happening to the hours of work? Well, um, productivity keeps going up. And wages aren't, so that first truism is broad. And that, you know, if we can become more productive, we have an increase in productivity, and without an increase in output, that's manifest, it leaves a statistical trace, in the words of Paul Brown and Paul Sweezy, in excess capacity and unemployment. Um, here's the neoliberal explanation. The productivity is going up because of those damn union workers, which I've been one for a while, uh, is going down. And uh, then let me bring the other part of labor force's population, and let me end with that. That if we do not 
reduce the growth rate of our population, we will face, on a global scale, mass starvation. But here's the dilemma of what happens when we do start to reduce population growth, which means basically that there's growing population Population growth in Surrey has a greater age in population. Um, that means there's fewer young people to support my lucrative retirement. Um, that not only are there fewer young people, but they've been having lower wages. And that means a greater share of the national output is going to be claimed by pensioners. But that's going to reduce productivity, and that's going to make the economy grow even more slowly. And as the economy grows more slowly, inequality becomes uh, more rampant. And every time you try to solve something, you've got another problem. So we, there's not enough ecological and biophysical economists to do this by ourselves. So we got to figure out who we're going to be in coalition. All right, thank you all.